Wild Rivers. Oh, yeah. Are you going to do that first? first? Sure. Yeah. Okay, we'd like to welcome all of you to our workshop. And if you would uh, stand and say the pledge with me, I would appreciate it. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and to, to the, the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Let me just introduce everybody. To my far left, we have Administrator Schroeder, uh, Commissioner Huxley, myself, Commissioner Gold, Commissioner uh, Boyce, Council Huddle, and Administrative Assistant John Jesuit. And first of all, uh, are there any amendments to the agenda? Uh, um, Mr. Schroeder? Madam Chair, I'd like to, uh, uh, under Section D, discussion items for the workshop, I'd like to switch and have the uh, uh, TLT ordinance brought to the uh, board first and then the employee manual second. Okay. Uh, any other amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, could I get a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Chair, I'd motion to approve the amend the amended agenda. Well, can I have a second? Second, Chair Gold. Okay. Call for the question. Aye. 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 Okay, so we're going to start with the uh, presentation, the Lower Rogue Watershed Council, Keller, uh, Kelly. Tim Chak is the coordinator, and I'll let you do your thing. Be sure you get in the microphone. This one here, or this one here? We'll get Whichever in there. one's more comfortable. Whichever one feels right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gold, and thank you, Commissioner Huxley and Commissioner Boyce, for having us today. Um, as Just you want said. want to introduce your other two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, um, is the presentation going to come on so much? You might have to do something to make that happen. Oh, we have a, we have, yeah, I'd sent it ahead of time, but I have a jump drive also. My okay. apologies. Thanks, guys. You might have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we can go ahead and introduce ourselves. I, I'm, uh, I'm Kelly Timchak. I'm the Lower Rogue Watershed Coordinator, and I'll let Liesl introduce herself. I'm Liesl Coleman. I'm the District Manager for the Curry Soil and Water Conservation District. And I'm Miranda Gray. I'm the Coordinator for the South Coast Watershed Council. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, thank you, sir. Talk more a little bit about this later, but we all make up together the Curry Watersheds Partnership. So we all three work together at the same office to create efficiencies and really help us streamline our work and our funding. So we hire all of our staff there with the Soil and Water District. All right, let's get there. Okay, so. This is just going to be a little bit about what we did this year, and then we'll look forward to a little bit next year um, of what we got on the slate as well. Hi, good morning. Um, what we have first, this is um, sort of on the Lower Rogue Watershed Council side, but we do this with internal staff, and the South Coast Council also participates in a lot of this work. So some of the work that we did over last summer was monitoring stream temperatures, and this is specifically for the Lower Rogue. Um, this picture here is Shasta Costa right there and then also we did some um, work in the slough you may know it as god wants you slough it comes off there um, behind freeman gravel um, and so what we're looking at with this temperature is we're trying to find basically baby fish small fish grow better and are healthier in cooler stream salmon and so a lot of times we're looking for these areas where these juvenile fish can hang out for the summer and stay cooler and grow better um, and get some refuge from that hot temperatures that we have or also in the winter when the river's raging really high they need a place to pull off the river and and be somewhere safe where they can eat as well so we looked at both of these places the um, slough had some really nice cold water inputs so we're going to be doing some restoration restoration work there in the future it helps us to guide our work moving forward and shasta we were looking at shade temperatures so see how it's recovering out there we also do a lot of um, riparian restoration out of our shop, and we do have a riparian manager there as well, um, which helps to guide our efforts, and a weed manager. And so this is an area, this is Shasta Costa Creek in the background there where it comes in. This is just above Agnes, if anybody's not really familiar um, with that area, but uh, beautiful stream, lots of cold water, um, but it also has um, some invasive weed problems. And so this was an English ivy and vinca vine 
issue, which a lot of times weeds, they just kind of create a monoculture. So, you know, wildlife can't enjoy it as well, can't use it as well, it doesn't provide nutrients, and it doesn't provide the proper erosion control so we can keep that sediment out of the river. And so this is an area where we removed it on the left. You'll see that's all vinca vine um, and then some ivy. We've removed it and that's been seeded and planted. The small one down here on the bottom was a new effort we did last year where we actually transplanted plants from the Forest Service. So you can pay a small fee and go and remove plants from Forest Service ground and then put them into restoration projects. So we did rhododendrons and ferns and huckleberries and it was just really cool to see the kind of bring in natural zoned plants. I'll talk a little bit about what the South Coast Watershed Council accomplished this year. And so our service area extends from the New River Flores Creek watershed up north to the Chetco or to the Winchuck watershed down south. Um, and a, a little caveat here, I've only been on board for seven weeks now. So um, <laughs> this is not all stuff that I accomplished, but um, stuff that I have taken on. Um, up north, we uh, partnered with the Langlois Water District and the Bureau of Land Management to um, do some watershed improvements, including uh, riparian restoration on Flores Creek, which you see on the left there, and then some sediment abatement also on uh, Flores Creek. And this was at the uh, drinking water source area for the town of Langlois. We also installed about uh, 40 log structures on Flores Creek to improve fish habitat um, and also promote bank stability. Um, the council also uh, installed two large bridges on uh, Crystal Creek, which is a tributary to the Sixes River and is uh, important stream habitat, particularly for the cutthroat trout. Um, so these big bridges open up about a mile of habitat in total and also um, provide a crossing for livestock and vehicles on this private ranch here. And more broadly, the partnership has been working on a uh, weed program. So the council has remained an active member in the, um, as part of the uh, Gorse Action Group, um, which is a group of partners, including agencies, nonprofits, landowners, and industry. And on the ground, the council has been most active in helping to manage Gorse in, in and around the Brookings area. And then that, the shared program within the partnership is working on these six priority weeds. I'll let Kelly take back over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so each year we hold an annual Rogue River cleanup here on the Rogue and we clean up the section typically from the very mouth of the river where we also have people doing beach cleanup at the same time, North Jetty, South Jetty. And then we take that all the way up to Agnes. So we have a crew that puts in at the Cougar RV park there and comes down. And then we have people that load up at Jerry's and go up. So we all meet together in the middle. We get out at Quisatina and we have a big barbecue for all of our volunteers and our kids. Um, so this year we had over 100 people again. And uh, we usually have anywhere from seven to 12 jet boat volunteers. These are just people in the community that have jet boats that volunteer their time, their gas, their boats. Um, which is really, really great. Um, we removed about 10 cubic yards of trash from the river this year. There wasn't as much, but that's still quite a bit. It's usually big things. As you can see, this is uh, Ryan McGinnis and Levi here. They pulled out some pretty big tires out of the river, so they work really hard at it. As soon as the kids find onto something they can dig out, they're just bee's knees, they're digging. So uh, we also removed scotch broom from the mill bar, so we do that every year too. That's kind of an ongoing removal. It's getting new seeds every year, but I think we are actually making some pretty good headway out there. Um, and then, as I said, we always serve a barbecue lunch. That's a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service. The Coos Forest Patrol comes out too. Um, and then a few other partners in town. We get all donations from businesses in town that help us to raise the money for the dollars. Um, the city of Gold Beach also donates to that. And then we have a big party out here at the park where the kids can play and put costumes on and they learn about the salmon life cycle inside of this big, it's a tent and they can crawl inside of the salmon and read stories in there. We love this event. <laughs> and then we have a shared watershed education program also with the, um, with the whole partnership. So this is uh, Stacia Ryder is the watershed education program manager and Kathy Bowden is our food shed program coordinator. And so some of the things they do, they do a lot of sort of 
first time these kids hear about salmon ecology, unless their parents are fishermen or, you know, get out and recreate with them, which a lot of people here do. So this is all third and fourth graders in the entire county. So all the schools here in the entire county, all the districts receive these classroom visits from Stacia and her crew where they talk about watersheds and riparian zones and macroinvertebrates and they get them out there where they eventually get to get out to a field trip and actually look at all these salmon habitat parameters and think about them and how they help in these streams and why they should care about that. So this is unique to our county because this is education that they're not receiving within the schools. So this is something we provide. Another thing they started this year um, was doing some pollinator habitats. So this was a really big thing in Brookings this year was doing a monarch pollinator gardens. And so they, re, you know, sort of revived some spaces in the school gardens there where they could grow out milkweed and other pollinator plants. And then the Calmeopsis Elementary School actually received a designation as the Monarch um, School USA because of all their efforts and all their work. And so they have been dedicated to making these little gardens and we're trying to do them throughout the rest of the county as well. Uh, another super cool program. Um, I think is the food shed program. So this is sort of your farm, your food, um, your watersheds and how that's all connected. So again, this is not something kids necessarily learn in school, um, but it's brought to them in their classroom. So they don't have to, it's not an after school thing, anything like that, everybody gets it. Um, so this is a 12 class curriculum to all fifth graders in the county um, where they learn about supporting local growers, they learn about making healthy food choices and they learn about conservation, which has a lot to do about your land and your healthy watersheds. Um, so as you can see here, they also do field trips. Is that going to come up? There it is. Yeah, they also do field trips out to local growers. So the top there is Valley Flora. There's the Wall Sheep Ranch and some cranberries here at the bottom. And so they kind of learn about how all these local foods come. They go watch sheep being born, which is amazing for a kid to see. <laughs> and adults, if you've never seen that. Um, they also have school gardens in all three schools as well, where they grow their own food and they're working on getting um, some of those foods into their cafeterias as well. And then the next slide here, they mostly use a lot of these foods for having a big dinner that they feed to the entire community, their parents um, at the end of the year. So they take cooking classes also where they learn how to use these local foods. And that's in middle school. That's a new sort of a new initiative we've got going on. And then they do this big outreach dinner. Last year they had 80 people there, so they cook all the meals and then serve them um, to the community. Very cool. That's in Port Orford, right? Yeah, that, yeah. that one was in Port Orford, yep. Thank you, Commissioner Boyce. Mm -hmm. Miranda? Yeah, and I just wanted to touch on quickly some of the important efforts that took place over the past year to um, make sure the South Coast Council in particular um, remains a sustainable organization without, within the county. Um, so. The council uh, undertook this prior prioritization process to develop a five-year strategic plan um, and rewrote their bylaws um, and also um, acquired some really important capacity funding from the Wild Rivers Coast Alliance um, and OWEB um, to make my position viable, um, but also to, to just make sure um, that the council continues to run. Um, and then we also brought on two new council members, which is also, which is always a, a big accomplishment. Um, and we'll continue to, to build it up in this coming year. Oh yeah. I get to do the slides that don't have pretty pictures, unfortunately, <laughs> but no less important work because as we all know, there's like this quiet behind the scenes planning and having conversations work that goes on. And that's what makes the pretty pictures happen. So um, we've been working on, uh, we received a, a focused investment partnership grant from OWEB a couple of years ago, and we've been working on a strategic plan for the um, estuaries in the county. And right now our area of focus is gonna be the Sixes Estuary, and our, um, our ecological objective is improving rearing habitat for salmonids. So we are madly putting our plan together this is not a regulatory document. This is basically a way of us to, for us to prove to funders that we've really thought this through. We've, we've got a, a theory of change and, and it'll make us more competitive for funding. We hope ultimately to go after a larger OWEB uh, focused investment implementation grant down the road. Um, that grant, uh, if successful, can bring in uh, up to $6 million over a, three, a six year period. Um, in work. 
Um, so keep your fingers crossed. Um, lots of good stuff happening there. We have lots of partners, um, but our chief partners are um, the Curry Watersheds Partnership, ODFW, and the Wild Rivers Land Trust. Those will be kind of the core group that make it happen. Let's see. Left click. Great. And then coming up in 2019, we're going to continue putting restoration on the projects on the ground, at least eight, um, probably more. Um, and then carry on with our watershed and food shed education grant. Um, we're working on some capacity building in there. Um, we've submitted an application for some additional Wild Rivers Coast Alliance funding. Um, and it's looking promising for that to be funded to uh, help us develop a long-term fundraising strategy for the education program to keep it viable. Um, I think I should mention that 100% of our funding is grants. We don't have any kind of tax base for the district or anything like that. So um, that's, it keeps us hopping going after the grant funds. Maintaining plantings and removing invasive weeds, monitoring um, and uh, continuing to build our, our partnership organization um, and developing the councils. More of the good stuff, yeah. And then just talking about um, the impacts overall of our ability to work together. Um, uh, the district's function kind of in the organization is to be the administrative anchor. We're the fiscal sponsor and the employer for the organization. So I'm usually hiding in the background doing all the numbers and all of the boring legal stuff, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, and that frees the rest of the gang up to be out there like finding the projects and writing the grants and making it happen. And it's created a, a wonderful model of efficiency. Um, yep, we'll continue on uh, our watershed education. We have these shared programs. A few of them were mentioned the vegetation program, the weeds and the riparian and the education and our monitoring, we kind of share all of that and bring resources in through all three organizations to make that happen. Um, we do bring in a, an average of a million dollars a year in grant funding um, and the bulk of that does go into the county um, through our staff, we keep, we keep people employed, um, contractors and um, procurement of goods. So, um, and we partner with uh, countless agencies um, to achieve uplift. We're kind of like eHarmony for <laughs> watersheds. <laughs> we connect um, people together. Um, and that's that. Anything else to say? Yeah, that's it. If anybody has any questions, we're happy questions? to take them. Commissioner Forrest? Yeah, just thank you, Ms. Coleman, for the work you do on the grants. That's the first time, though, on the invasive species, which I really appreciate the work you do on that, too. That is something. Um, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. I've never heard it distinguished, though, between weed, invasive species and invasive weeds. Is there, is that something that you're dealing with, or is it a, are they different categories, I guess is what I'm asking. We're mostly dealing, I think, with weeds, because species would also include, you know, like mud snails and the mussels that come in, and I don't know if we're doing a whole heck of a lot with those species. We have not tackled those yet. It's yeah. been weeds. And yeah, we just refer to them all as weeds. Yeah, oh yeah that's right. <laughs> right now we're doing the plant version of the weeds, but okay. not the animal version. I also should mention that the district is the um, uh, weed control district for the county. So that's one of the roles that we fulfill um, uh, as well. So do you but go to homes too? Um, <laughs> if we have grant funding, yes. And right now we do have grant funding that will allow us to um, treat certain kinds of weeds on private and on public lands. I was just noticing I've got a lot of those <laughs> my place. So. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Call. Give us a call. We've got a guy. <laughs> Actually, we have two you guys. You guys are weed busters, huh? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Any other comments from the commissioners? Okay. Thank great, you so much, Wayne. Great presentation. So much. Thank you very much. Okay. Next. Who did the logo? Her husband. Oh. Diesel, together actually did it. That is really nice. Okay, next up we have the uh, transit lodging tax ordinance. Administrator Schroeder.
Okay, this is um, uh, the packet for those who are following along. This is what's on the website. So I'm just going to walk through this. And uh, the board has already seen this, they reviewed this, so I'll go briefly over what we're doing in order to enter into a discussion for the board to ask questions and to guide staff further with this proposal. And in a brief, basically, we've been meeting with the uh, Citizens Revenue Task Force with the county board approved and uh, delegated earlier in like or late 2017 it never really got fulfilled we just recently in the last few months appointed enough members to fulfill that we've had four meetings yeah four meetings or so and as you well aware one of the things that uh, the the transit and lodging tax had been worked on by the fair board themselves and the friends of the fair and they had originally wanted to uh, get uh, proposed this and have it put on the ballot by a uh, citizen the initiative. It was found that it can't be by citizens the initiative. So a lot of the, the work on the TLT was already done uh, ahead of time. And so there's been some good research and good analysis that's done. And so that's why that is coming forth to you for discussion at this point. The few, the, as you're well aware, that doesn't really solve the overall uh, economic shortfall of the county because we're going to need more money than just this. The majority of the TLT goes to tourism related and promotion activities. So simultaneously with the Citizens Revenue Task Force working on the TLT, we're also working on what we tend to call the big fix. What would it, what would it take to you know, you know, sustain the county in the long run? And so we're doing an analysis of overall budget stability, budgets availability, and uh, other types of options for cost savings to make the county solid in that. So with that, I'm just gonna go through, there, there's a couple memos in the front which kind of briefly talk about that. Uh, Mr. Huddle put a memo together that talks about some of the, the legal aspects of it, which you have had the opportunity to review. But I'm, I think the best point here would just be go through the uh, PowerPoint presentation, which the which a fair board had put together and presented to the Citizens Revenue Task Force gives a, a, a highlight view of, of what this type of uh, ordinance would have. And then after that, we'll, we'll enter with uh, questions and discussions. So the local transit ta tax is a tax imposed by a unit of local government on sales, service, or furnishings of, of transit lodging. Transit lodging means a hotel, motel, inn dwellings that are used for temporary overnight occupancy and spaces used for parking recreational vehicles, erecting tents during periods of human occupancy, cabins, condominiums, apartments, or other dwellings used that are used for temporary human occupancy. One of the things um, that I think later on in here, it does talk about the fact that if you're, if you're at a place where you're... Yeah, we have a question could, here. Not a question. Could you, you could move that and eliminate that about quarter to the right, just click that right arrow, just to your left. Go down. No, no, no. Uh, now go up and, and get that out. Get <laughs> oh, that out you. of the way. It might make it a little bit easier to read. There you go. Voila. Thank you. <laughs> yes. One of the things I think later on in this uh, discussion is, so if you're having houses that are rented for over 30 days, if it's correct, those are not included within there. Those are our, those turn into rentals. But when you're talking a vacation that's 30 days or less, that would be transient in there. Um, state law basically in Mr. Huddle's memo will detail this for you, that 70% of the net revenue from a new or increased local transit lodging tax will be used for purposes described in the subsection later on. No more than 30% of net revenue from a new or increased local transit logic tax may be used for purposes uh, for the county, basically. So the 70% of, of this revenue would be to fund tours and promotion or tours related facilities, meaning capital improvements, things that would drive and increase tourism within our county. Uh, it could it could finance debt for tourism related facilities. It could also pay reasonable administrative costs in, incurred in financing or refinancing that debt. And it goes through what that is. Um, to, to make a point here, and this, this discussion came up, the, uh, the word transit, obviously, uh, some people confuse that, uh, but within the 
statutes if we do if you adopt this and you go forward with this that word has to be somewhere within the ballot measure because that's a state state law it can't be just say it's a hotel tax it has to be the, the tra TLT is a specific code that would have to have that word in there somewhere you could you could add that to that but it's an it's a tax that in, is incurred by customers so it's not a tax if you're not using a hotel or you're not temporarily camping or RVing within this county, the citizens don't pay for it. Um, jurisdictions around this, jurisdictions around the state have this. There's probably over 100 that have different TLTs, anywhere from 2 to 13. Most are 6 to 9 percent. We are, uh, the group is looking at a 7 percent TLT for this particular proposal for your consideration today. Here's some statistics that we have have a million and a half overnight visitors to the county and this was put on by uh, this was put together by Dean Runyon Associates <coughs> travel impact studies visitor spending was 132 million spent 29 million for lodging the average stay is two nights so here's the meat of it right here basically so the la these are the figures for the last um, last year 2017 basically and this is for the unincorporated areas of the county if that's correct right yes so unincorporated areas of the county would have 12.9 million dollars of county sales at a seven percent revenue we would get nine hundred thousand there would be uh, forty five thousand dollars that would be kept by the individual hotels or uh, proprietors for administrative fee on that leaving $860,000. 70% of that $860,000 would be used for promotions, which would be $602,000. And 25%, uh, the, the, the remaining 30%, basically, a government agency can dictate as they, as they want. The proposal from the Citizens Revenue Task Force is that 25% of that would be used for sheriff patrols and 5% for administrative fee at the county. And so if you were to split up that 602,000 into half, um, where you could use the difference between, let's say, internal county promotion, the fair or parks or other types of county, uh, tourism related infrastructure projects, and then maybe the other half for event center. So or I mean for other distributions around north, south, and central counties. The, those are the things that basically that the we would like to discuss with the county board. So there's uh, two separate ordinances that you're going to see in your packet today. One is Division 1, and this is detailed within the memo. Division 1 basically talks about imposing the tax on the citizens. That's the sole ordinance that the voters will vote on. It's in the, the distribution of that money is an administrative decision, meaning that would be division two. So in your packet, you see two ordinances, like I said before. And the recommendation of the Citizens Revenue Task Force is that the county board would consider and pass these two ordinances together so the citizens have a, a better idea of what the money will be used for, you know, speaking from a marketability standpoint. So I'll go through that one more time. Division one ordinance is strictly about imposing the tax. And that's what would go before the citizens, basically saying here's a 7% tax and it's for transit and lodging and it'd be 70% promotions, 30% for county. The division two ordinance within your packet today would detail how is that money decided where does it go and what the committee is recommending is that you again you'd pass both those simultaneously till the citizens know it's just not up to the county board they're going to be using a tourism related committee which is what I'm detailing here so you have seven members two from each of the three defined school districts and one at large members must represent tourism industry no more than three members from similar industries annual needs assessment, annual uh, strategies presented to the public and approved by the county commissioners, an annual report on the funds. So what would happen is, is 
uh, these will all be worked out logistics wise, but they would probably see, receive grants or requests for projects for capital tourism related projects in the, in the county. And they, the, this local tourism promotion committee would make a recommendation to the governing body, meaning the county board, for um, the distribution of those funds. In addition, in the division two, the Citizens Revenue Task Force is recommending that we stick with what you saw earlier in the presentation, which was 25% of the money would go to sheriff's patrol and 5% for administration. Technically, that money could go somewhere else, but we feel the, that would be the best use, the best and highest use of that 25% that comes back to the, to the county. Again, that would be a board decision. The board could change their mind if they didn't support that type of distribution of that money, but this is a, will be the recommendation of the task force itself. There's also a local review committee which would oversee the policy and regulations of this. This would basically be legal counsel, accountant, TLT collector, and two members at large, and these would basically hear approves, hear uh, appeals concerning this tax. So there'll be questions that will arise probably on what's applicable, what's not applicable, what's in, what's included and what's not included, and basically this local review committee would would hear those hear those appeals. Um, so with that, we would basically enter into the uh, division one. And so this is your this is your ordinance that talks about imposing the tax on the on the on the tourism tourists coming into our county, and. It, there, it's really not overly complicated. I think this is this is just a flat, you know, I think one of the issues the county board would want to consider is do they want to have a 7% or a 6% or a 9%? Though all that type of analysis would be something that the board could direct staff and going back to the Citizens Revenue Task Force to analyze. I will say that we will be having a Citizens Revenue Task Force meeting at 2 o'clock on Friday the 14th to basically incorporate any feedback or any questions that the county board has today so we can analyze that and come back based on the direction because ultimately this will be a county board decision that you will vote on to put onto the ballot. The goal of this whole thing is to basically put it on the ballot for the May election. So there are some time critical factors here. There is a cutoff of February sometime for the ballot language to be uh, drafted up. Um, as you're well aware, ballot languages for initiatives have a review period, so you draft the language up, you submit it, citizens have 10 days to review that language to make sure that they, it's clear, it's understandable, it's not uh, deceptive, <coughs> and then basically you would submit it to the clerk. All those details would come forward. This is just a workshop here. We would make a more formal presentation on the timelines if and when the county board wants to bring this up for a vote. So we're flying at a higher level today, just kind of fill you in, see what kind of questions you have. Uh, again, this is still division one. It talks about, again, the 70% uh, funding tourism related, finance debt for tourism related facilities. The balance would be used uh, for general fund and costs incurred in collection and the remaining 25 percent would be used for the sheriff so this would be basically the only details that the citizens would vote on would be this highlighted yellow area simultaneously with that the again to reiterate the the citizens revenue task force is looking to have division two adopted at the same time and both these would both these would be contingent of course on citizen approval and a referendum in may so this goes through some of the same de definitions the collection of the tax how the tax is collected uh, registration of lodging providers forms certificate of uh, authenticity due dates penalties i think Again, one of the things that the county board would want to consider and discuss under Division Two would be would be the allocation. So this is where you basically would come back. Technically, the county board could just be the sole arbitrator of the distribution of these funds. They could decide 
what they wanted to do, but I think in this case, I think what the Citizens Revenue Task Force is they basically are recommending that we basically have a tourism related uh, tourism promotions committee, which would have a sole duty of studying requests and grants in order to make a recommendation to the board. I think it, they would provide expertise being in the tourism area. And then in this yellow section, you can see the, again, the details of what that committee would be. Uh, annually, they would do that, what the first meeting would be, subsequent years, the uh, partnerships. So this is kind of the meat of some of the questions, I think, that uh, in discussion at this workshop that you'd want to consider if you would support this type of a recommendation for that. So I know this is a super high level brief introduction for this subject, but you know, hearing from the Citizens Revenue Task Force and other people within the county, it's not the first time the county has tried this. So um, I think people are fairly familiar with it. So with that, uh, I would take questions or Mr. Huddle could take questions on his particular uh, legal analysis of the distribution and the management of the funds. One of my comments would be every time I go and spend time in a motel anywhere here in this state, generally speaking, I figure the percent of tax. It's usually around 10 to 11 percent. And so my thinking is if you were to put that in, then the excess for the cities that already have a TLT could go into the county TLT. Like if Gold Beach charges 6%, then 4% of that would go to the county. Everybody countywide would have 10% or whatever is decided here. I think the committee landed on 7% because if, I, if I'm correct, I think that's what the cities are currently charging to make it uniform. Is that correct? Equalize it. Equalize it, yeah. So, um, there, one of the questions I think for county council would be, can the, can the initiative, do the local municipalities have to approve this? So let's say Brookings, would they have to approve uh, an extra 3% to go onto their TLT within their city or can an overall county vote basically be imposed on the Brookings even if the Brookings citizens themselves do not approve it? Sure glad I didn't get that question. No, that's a good question. So, no, the individual citizens of Brookings would not have to um, approve the tax that applies within Brookings. Um, I, well, is I this going to be a vote countywide? Brookings residents voting? Okay, if it's a, a vote countywide, then that would be a 10% if we decided on that countywide and then maybe put something in there that the city, since they already have 6% or 7%, would chip in the difference. Right, in other words, they wouldn't have to vote separately on anything that applied within the city of Brookings, but there would be, you know, the question would be whether you would carry the Brookings vote, depending on how you phrase the question. So it's more a political question than a legal question. Well, if this only applies to unincorporated areas, why would cities be voting on stuff for the unincorporated areas, is my question. Well, um, I think it'd just be on the general ballot. So I'd, it's a, probably a question for the clerk, but I think if it's on the countywide ballot, um, it would be, it would apply in the county. But let me just talk to you about this one um, here's the here's the statute 203075 and it says when a county um, hold on a second here it is <clears throat> so it's actually 203.040 and it says, except by consent of the governing body or electors of a city. So maybe perhaps Mr. Sh the answer to Mr. Schroeder's question is yes. Here's what it says, except by consent of the governing body or electors of a city, um, and except in cities not regularly operating as such through elected government officials, I guess that means unincorporated cities, ordinances adopted under 203.030 to 203.075 
and exercise of the police power shall not apply inside an incorporated city. So when we're adopting ordinances, they don't apply inside an incorporated city unless approved by the voters of the incorporated city. But yeah, they're voting on it. That's interesting. I, I would ask the clerk that question. I don't think the county carves out cities uh, when we do elections, but that's, that's a question for the clerk, how they run them. I know we're doing a special district election, and we're, that's only going to be the members of the district and the proposed annexation to the district, but that's a separate standalone idea there. Right, and when you do city councilors, it's only for the city, so it could, you know, they could carve out whatever, I would think. It was also brought to my uh, attention by Dave that uh, there currently is a 1.8% state TLT. So the unincorporated areas and the cities are already collecting that 1.8. So when you, when you talk about going to the 10%, there's already a 7% plus a 1.8%. So they're at... So that'd be 8.8. 8. Yeah, if that's correct. Is that permanent, that 1.8%? Do you know? Okay. Yeah, and, and like I say, if, if like one of the committees want to come up, up and talk about it, um, you know, or have questions, I, like I say, I'm a little new to the game here, so. Okay, well, I'm kind of getting in the minutia here, I know. Uh, Commissioner Huxley? I'd like to hear County Council review his memo and summarize his memo. Oh, okay, thank you. And this, this memo that I wrote went to, you heard part of Mr. Schroeder's uh, explanation was that when a ballot title is prepared and the ballot measure is submitted, there's a time to review uh, whether it meets the legal requirements to go to the voters. And one of the things that gets reviewed is called whether the uh, proposed ordinance is legislative or administrative. The general rule is voters can only adopt legislation and the Board of Commissioners would uh, administer the legislation that's adopted. So uh, the court cases have analyzed whether ballot measures and things proposed to be voted on by the voters are administrative or legislative. So the last time Curry County put to the voters a transient lodging tax, it had two components similar to this one, a ordinance imposing the tax and then an ordinance implementing the tax or administering the tax and in that case the ordinance and that was I think July August 2015 um, and in that case the um, the ordinance imposing the tax also included some elements of how the tax would be spent uh, more fine-tuning beyond the 70 30 split uh, identified in the state laws so uh, since that time, or actually right around that time, there was a case out of a different county, I think it was Multnomah County, I, I, I'm speaking from memory here, but it's in my materials, where there was a proposal and an ordinance adopted by that county government to uh, spend through a series of agreements their transient lodging taxes. And the voters tried to refer that to a vote and the, the uh, courts said the spending details of the measure uh, were administrative and not, um, and, and not legislative and therefore it was not a proper subject for the voters. So in my memo, I'm recommending that if we adopt these two ordinances and it, it's similar to how we did the marijuana tax we have a ordinance imposing the tax, just saying that we're going to impose the tax. And if there's any details about how the money will be spent beyond just a 70-30 split, that those be included in the implementation ordinance, which uh, courts could view as administrative and therefore uh, not subject to voters. And that's, so basically a very simple ordinance imposing the tax and the more detailed spending elements, how, where it will go, this kind of thing, including um, the appeals process and the uh, referral bodies and again I heard Mr. Schroeder you also say that the um, I guess these uh, the, the, the body established with the two folks from each 
school district area as well as a uh, at-large at member, but those would recommend spending to the board before spending decisions were made. I thought I'd seen one version of the ordinance where it was different than that, but um, maybe there will be more discussion on that point. But uh, Mr. Huxley, did that summarize fairly the memo that I wrote? I could pull it up and just read it verbatim, but essentially if well, you have spending details and something that goes to the voters, that could be viewed as administrative. It, it, it goes to the, the key because I, you know, there's another, and you've referenced it in this memo also, document from the AG to the, the clerks, all of mm -hmm. the, the state clerks as far as the 2015 yes. case. Um, and the, the key is in an initiative, or the, let's just forget that, it's, is it legislative or is it administrative? And on, even on the PowerPoint, um, on page, I believe it was eight, what it was. Page 8 of 33, it says, tax measures cannot be placed on a ballot by a citizen's petition. Only the governing body has that authority, and that is not correct. It depends. Is it a legislative, just, you know, goes with what's, what's established already, or is it an administrative where you really get into the weeds and you get all these committees and everything else? Um, and my point or my position has been previous. Oh, and, and I'll come back to that, but one other question before I come back to that point. Uh, were members of some of these hospitality groups, hotels, motels, restaurants, et cetera, involved with the Revenue Tax Force meet members in the meetings for their input because that was a main point of contention in, I think it was more towards November of 15, but it was in 15 when the last TLT tax was some of the opponents of that were members of the, of the hospitality industry because nobody was ever even asked to participate with the uh, the individuals who presented the um, the tax, and so my question is: Are were members of the are members or have members of that area or industry been involved in these discussions and these decisions? We've not sent out specific invites. So uh, there were no no members of in those groups that were present or had volunteered for the meeting. So, I, I think the That's same thing is occurring that occurred last time is that, you know, you make these decisions and you exclude key players from the industries that you're going to tax. Um, and I guess lastly, and then, you know, uh, my position has been and still remains is that because of the uh, universal failure uh, of tax measures over the last, when I say universal, I think without exception, over the last 10 to 15 years, that a citizen-driven initiative would be much more likely, in my opinion, to pass than a two or three member board of commissioner <laughs> directive that something be put before the voters again where an initiative you're required <coughs> to have the, in the neighborhood of a thousand signatures um, and you get that many people that are involved and I think there's a very good much 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 greater chance that that whatever that initiative is because it is citizen driven would be uh, likely to pass versus versus not so uh, again um, well, to, to answer, I think we're doing... Question, to, to answer a couple questions, uh, Car Carl basically is going to talk about the hotel uh, in input. Right. Yes, if I may. Carl King, the Seca Beach. I am the chair of the Citizens Revenue Task Force. And at our meeting on November 9th, the second meeting we had, the task force voted unanimously to propose 
the two ordinance system with specific allocations in the first ordinance between the the fairgrounds if you will the event center and the rest of the industry with the advice of county council that that would not be appropriate at our meeting on november 30th we revisited that issue and voted to support what you see in front of you one that takes imposes the seven percent tax and then has the 70 percent and the 30 percent with 25 percent of the 30 percent going for road deputies we you mean 25 percent of 25 percent of the okay. total gotcha we preferred our original proposal which was that 35 percent half of the 70 percent would go to the event center for capital improvements and the other 35 percent would be allocated under the second phase which you have in front of you the implementation phase and we did have reports from people who have been working with the industry if you will specifically who had talked to the leaders of the opposition if you will the last time the TLT was put before the voters and we we make that recommendation comfortable that the industry while no industry likes to have anything like this imposed upon them that you're not going to see the opposition this time as we saw the last time now the the one thing i need to emphasize is that on november 30th we did not reconsider the implementation proposal and the proposal we felt was one that answered some of the complaints of the industry the last time the last time the tourist industry said we know better how to spend our money if we want to promote our business and so what we had presented to us primarily from the fair board after much work with the industry and a consultant an implementation proposal that would set up that seven member committee two from each section school districts if you will plus one at large and that that group would make a proposal to the board of commissioners in the nature of a business plan it would recommend to your board the parameters and the areas of emphasis that that 35 percent should be put to and if your board agreed to that then that seven member committee would actually make the decisions how to spend the money that if your board recommended that of the 35 percent five percent go to enhance a certain type of tourism that then the committee would decide who would get grants out of that to address that need and frankly the reason we think that is key to this proposal is that no one in the view consensus of our task force believes the voters will vote yes on a proposal that hands into the hands of the county commissioners with no other controls other than budgetary controls nine hundred thousand dollars or six hundred thousand dollars it's just not going to happen that money has to be earmarked and the proposal that you'll see in front of you i think at the the last subparagraph of what's yellowed it's a specific thing that says there'll be no you cannot direct grants or earmark when you vote on that marketing budget if you will that we think that is very important and we as as the administrator says we specifically scheduled a meeting for tomorrow at two o'clock and we will right. or friday when we meet we will take into account your comments and we will
come back to you with our final recommendation on this because we're ready to move on. We want to move on to other. Uh, we want to look at a prepared food tax we're looking at and we got, as another short, you know, partial solution to the problem and then the big fix. And we hope to get both of that done and, you know, both those done by the end of January because, and, and again, you know, on Commissioner Huxley's need, you know, everyone on the task force is committed that if this goes forward to organize the pack, to get out and get the groups to spend the evenings with across the county meeting with groups of people to explain it and to promote it. We're not just going to make a recommendation and walk away from this. But county council says we can't put it on the ballot with a citizen initiative. So we must look to the Board of Commissioners to vote to put it on the ballot. Thank you. Mr. Boyce? Uh, the lodging establishments that I've talked to are fine with the representation on the board. And I think there's been, uh, almost a little bit to my surprise, there's been some really good effort expertise. And uh, the, the plan before us may need a little bit of work between now and, say, for example, the 1st of February. But I think we're, you know, I'm just really pleased to see what we have here. Um, and so, and also, do we have other, do we have public comments uh, for this? Nobody People turned in a slip, no. But we, usually not for workshops, no. But we could ask uh, Madam Chair, if there's somebody that wants to offer some comments, uh, I would encourage the board to uh, see if there's anybody interested in speaking on this. I think it's Ron, is it? Dave. Dave, I'm sorry. You're on the committee, right? Okay. My name is David Haney, um, the Seca Beach Ofer. Um, I was actually in a meeting on Monday with who was one of the people who was our greatest opponent in the last um, tax when it was voted down. And they reviewed what we were doing and they felt that this covered their big complaint. What which, was their big complaint? Um, basically what? Uh, Clark just said that you're talking about they, 2015 yeah that, Mr. You know, they, they didn't feel that the way it was written the last time that the money was going to be spent effectively uh, they liked the fact that there were was a board a separate board that would make recommendations on how that money should be spent and that it wasn't just a lump of money that was thrown into the general fund uh, that was their big complaint last time so um, quite frankly just Speaking from one person's perspective, um, I think the public would like to see something happen as a result of this rather than just down a hole. Yeah. They want to see the results. Right. And the way we had discussed setting it up, um, you know, there would be basically seven people in tourist related businesses, uh, no more than three of any particular business, like, say, motels so that we don't have one group coming in and saying this is how you're going to do it. Um, we've had that happen in other groups that I've been involved in, the America's Wild Reverse Coast, things like that, where we want, we want to have enough input from other people. So I think we can, uh, at least we, we don't appear to have any major opposition. We haven't found anybody out there who's going to be totally against this. And um, the people who you know, put all the money up last time uh, seem to feel that, you know, this this would be something favorable. So we'd like to see at least a chance to do that. Um, and, you know, there's there's a, there are enough people involved in, in the task force from varying uh, types of businesses. I happen to be in vacation rentals. Um, most of ours average around 2,000 a week. So when we're talking a 9%, almost 9% tax, this is a big hit. So I wouldn't Well, be, but it's not going to be hitting you personally. Oh, I know, but it, I, have to, I have to collect it from my guests, so. And that's why the 5% administrative fee. Yeah, but it's a matter of, uh, in fact, even right now, when the state imposed their first 1% tax, people would ask how much tax, and I'd say 1%, and they thought I had misspoken. Oh, you mean right. 10%? Right. Because they're used to paying it, so. That's um, right. But it's still, you know, it's something that we would have to. So what are your feelings about having, say, 10% or 9%? I mean, as long as we're doing it, just Well, 
initially we we don't want to get too high because we're competing with other counties around us we're also competing with california california del nord is actually looking at imposing a new tlt also um we what felt they that they right now i don't have that figure uh, i just had heard that the other day in a discussion that uh, they're putting something on for their their county and, and quite frankly, I'm just speaking for myself again. When I go to book a motel, I don't look at what's the tax. Yeah, everybody almost expects it. If you're up in Portland or Seattle or I was back in Minneapolis, um, it was like 27% in Minneapolis with all their, I think I was even supporting the Mall of America and I thought they got enough money. I, they didn't I think people mind. are looking at a destination rather than, oh, uh, someone someone charges so much sales tax and they charge two percent less i'm gonna change my location because of that i i just don't think that's going to happen well see right now we we have the three cities have a tax and they average seven percent um plus the 1.8 percent with the state um in the county we only have the 1.8 percent mm -hmm. so if you aren't so in you're going through that process now in the county anyway and adding extra isn't going to be that much more in administrative costs or would it be i don't know well it's it's just a matter of getting it implemented and you know implementation of it and that but um the seven percent would would be with the nine well the 8.8 .8 total would be an average that's pretty close to what most people would be expecting um, if we go too high it's nice to have the extra money but are we accomplishing what we really want which is to attract visitors. Well, and I'm sure you've discussed it yeah. a and, lot. You know, an awful lot of, you know, the money uh, hopefully would be spent to bring more visitors to the area. And as I've explained, I was talk talking to court the other day, um, you, can, uh, you can get somebody to go anywhere one time, but your advertising dollar doesn't make any money until they've returned the second, third, or fourth time. And then you've actually made some money on them. But up until then, you know, you are just throwing the money away, hoping somebody shows up at your doorstep. Yeah, I don't think it should all be spent on advertising. Uh, we don't either. Uh, however, because of the way it's set up with uh, Gold Beach and uh, Brookings, especially Port Orford's is pretty small. Um, we could tie in with some of their advertising that they're already doing and, uh, and you know, make it a little, little bigger bang. But we were thinking more along the line of having this available to improve facilities make things better um, we don't have any groups out there right now that are actually looking at doing new things uh, because they haven't had anything to work with so. well if you look at the ports i'm thinking of the port of brookings harbor yep. if you compare that with say the bandon port or some of those other ports it's you know it's a diamond in the rough it waiting is. to happen and I think the fairgrounds could also be a diamond in the rough to get the conventions yeah. that are going. Right. So, you know, it's just, if the, the more we can improve facilities to attract people. Um, right now we bring in, for let's like, say the fairgrounds, we, we have smaller conventions for 150 to 300 people. A uh, larger facility would be, would be nice. And it isn't just beneficial for the central curry, it's the whole county. Um, you can't well, I get think here. right now there really is no place in Curry County to have a big convention. That's true. That's... Commissioner Boyce? Could you introduce some of the members of the board here and also could somebody uh, give a little more detail on the 5%? Uh, anybody from the, the committee could do that. The 5% that you would get as a bed and breakfast for collecting county, how that works. Well, there. basically. If I collected a hundred dollars uh, as a collector, I would keep five percent of that. Uh, when you go to the state form, it's a one-page form. You put in the amount you've co collected. Um, if you have any exemptions, like you know, people federal don't pay the taxes, um, and then if people have stayed longer than thirty days, they don't pay the taxes. And how much you've actually now you have. You deduct 5% and you send the state the rest. And that money comes back. Uh, it just stays in my account. Uh, well, actually, my owner's account. They don't give it to me, I wish. But um, it uh, is basically there to take care of the, the paperwork and putting it together. 
and um, the county would receive a similar 5% to cover your costs of having to monitor and, and collect or whatever. Or one recommendation was we had talked with, uh, in a roundabout way, with the city of Gold Beach. Um, they already have everything set up. They could actually help collect the county tax. It would go through their system and back to you so that we don't have to actually hire new people, invent everything. Um, it, you know, as, as I know the county has a problem with having uh, people available to do extra work right now. So um, it's not that complicated if you set it up properly. It's just a simple form. It's almost all done on a computer. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Haney. Ron had a question here. Sorry. Ron? I wasn't going to speak, so sorry. No, actually, I appreciate that you reached out to some of these hotel owners. and. Uh, Ron Crook, and I, I wanted to let the board know that before we, we've been working, uh, a separate group was working on this proposal since July. But before they even started working, we were approached by the major uh, opponents from three years ago that came to uh, us and said, you need to get busy on this proposal, a new proposal for TLT. So we had input from them from the start before we worked for three months, this was before the county had uh, a committee that they've appointed. And then David and I put our names in because we were working on this other committee and presented our, our findings and thoughts. And, but we want to assure you that these opponents came to us and actually urged us to do something and they are the basis for what you see that we presented so i just want to let you know that we from the very start had the input from them so their big concern coming back to this they were unsure that they would see anything for their money with they, that they wanted to specifically specified where money is going and of course now we we've informed them that with county council's input that you sure. you only can do that in ordinance two the ordinance one that goes to the voters must uh just be uh without designating where money is going so they understand that now that and none of us were aware of that until uh, a, a month ago so anyway just want to assure you that we had input from some of the uh, opponents of the major from 2015. that's good to know miss wiley uh thank you Catherine wiley member of the uh, committee uh one other thing just to add uh, uh councillor huddle uh, brought up the third option for uh, handling the revenue and that would be if I correct me if I'm wrong uh, that the state could do it as they are doing with the marijuana tax and that actually there is a potential that there then could be more than 25 percent it might be less than five percent of what they would charge if that makes sense does that make sense right it wouldn't cost as much to right. administrate the thing right and um, so that's I, I just wanted to bring that up so there are options as far as the processing and processing fees thank you thank you yeah i don't know who you are but if you've got something oh, no, important no. to say come he's on trouble up. trouble i don't know whether we know bob more. Chibante, and i'm for gold beach and i've been involved with the committees here and do that <laughs> Um, look at, when looking at this proposal, I think this is a good thing for the citizens when you're looking at this. I, it was mostly an issue we lost was on marketing the first time. There was no really support in support of the in favor vote last time and it was still very close. So looking at this here, it's to me, 
it's one portion of the community that comes here and uses county services that are not paying towards county services. Um, in addition, the way this is set up is, I think the best thing for it is to see in the facilities. Because right now, it, the, the major portion of the fairgrounds would be the major attractant to the county to bring people in. And the idea of redeveloping the, the, the fairgrounds and improving the fairgrounds to bring more people in here so we can get larger groups and improve that facilities and understanding that. So this would be one way a lot of tax measures has failed because it's always been coming from the residents and homeowners. You look at most of the things. This is not coming from residents. This is not coming out of our pockets to do this. It's coming from people to visit. And as you say, you go other places. If you go to the valley, it's 18% between city and county. So I think the level was looking at one to make it even, it's all fair, county, cities, everybody's all the same. Uh, the big problem the, the last time was is just transient. That's why we mentioned transient. So we had to, a lot of people said, well, we shouldn't tax transients or why do transients have to pay tax? They have no money. So it was, a, it was an educational thing and I think it would be a far better push for educational things going on here right now to do this. So visitors are coming business owners aren't paying this, they're actually getting paid. Um, if you go to California, you fill out that tax and you don't get paid for it, you just don't get to do business. So at least we're offering something here to do that. And I think the other impact you can put on here with the sheriffs, my thought is, is that is what the sheriff, the patrol deputy is part in here, it's still a kind of a tourism related because we have more tourism is gonna to impact the sheriff's department. So that's gonna help. And I think people will see that and if we get this thing and we see facilities getting improved to attract people that get here, you can have great bells and whistles, whistles, internet, great pictures to do, but when they get here, if they don't see nothing here to do, then they don't return, they don't come back. So I think this is one way to help us develop our assets here, be important for the community of the whole county, to hear people coming from south, people coming through the north, and it'll work. I, it's, so that's what we're looking at. And I think that was our, if you look at the, what it actually was when we looked at the voting stuff, it was very close. And it was because of the, the advertising they had against and we no longer have that opposition on that. So I, I see it as a, as a very good thing to do it so people can understand. And then yes, we, we look about the big picture that it's not gonna fund everything that we need for the county. But if this gets through and the citizens see what's happening, they see some improvements, stuff like that, they say, hey, we see things that happen, that make, make things down the road a little bit more palatable to help out later on. So you, they have to say that, look, we're doing something. Yes, they said they're doing what they said they're gonna do, and we see an improvement in both our economy and just our well-being of the community. Okay, thank Thanks. you. And let me just say one other thing. When I talked to Ron Crook, he came to talk to me about this. He was mentioning that the fair would get 50% at the fairgrounds in perpetuity. And I think both he and I agreed that it shouldn't be in perpetuity. He should be able to, or the fairground should be able to get complete. And then we focus on some other areas, say the ports or something like that. Because I think those, like I said before, those ports are really important for tourists. We've got lots of fishing and so forth going on. Yes. I think I also want to highlight one thing of the consensus of the Citizens Revenue Task Force is that the additional revenue for the Sheriff's Department, their intent is not to be that supplanted from other general funds. They would want this money that would go to the Sheriff's Department to increase Sheriff patrols, not to say we're just going to decrease county funding to the Sheriff and he gets nothing different. That's kind of the consensus of the group. Now obviously that would be a budget committee decision. but. Um, Council Huddle. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And I heard some things about um, whether the citizens could initiate a tax measure. Again, uh, the distinction that I made on what the citizens can uh, vote on is whether it's legislative or administrative. Um, but I didn't say that the citizens could not initiate a legislative tax measure. I think uh, that seems possible looking through the initiative and petition materials in the Oregon Constitution. But I, they could not submit these measures to the voters as they are because they appear administrative. So that's really kind of the distinction there. There were a lot of things being said about um, you know, what I was saying the citizens could initiate or not. And my understanding is they can initiate matters of legislation. 
Um, but if it's too administrative, that's where the problem is. Any other comments or questions? Is there any changes that the you know that you have or questions about the proposals as you've read through it? When we meet on Friday, one of our subjects will be to discuss any feedback we got from you. But if you seem happy with what the proposal is, um, I think we'll just you know we'll just keep going with that and we'll do some further refinement and review of it to make sure we're all on board. Commissioner Boyce? Just a quick comment. The only thing I have a, not a reluctance or apprehension, but just a concern, any kind of real or perceived division in the county, you know, just if there's some way that it, and I'm not saying this hasn't been done, but if it can be worded to, to make it a benefit, and I think to some extent that's been done, but to make it a benefit to all the county uh, with, yes, the emphasis on the event centers, I understand it was the original plan here. But just, uh, you know, so oftentimes the county's divided, and I'm hoping this goes the opposite way and is an opportunity to bring the county together. And I think, Bob, you, you uh, highlighted that pretty good and in, in kind of an indirect way. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Any other comments? I think you should proceed. Uh, it's, it's well thought out. So that's my opinion. Any other comments? One other comment from one of the committee members, Bill Ostrowski. Bill Ostrowski from Gold Beach. Uh, one thing I think that's important, we talked about a pack getting out and talking to the people before this gets to the, to the voting stage. That is one of the main things that we're gonna be working on is that forming that pack, getting the word out to the voters of the importance, how the money is going to be used, how it will be administered, and so forth. But one of the more important things is that the pack needs to know that the commissioners are behind the proposal. You know that you guys are united in this, because that's going to go a long ways in making sure this thing gets passed through the voters. Just one. Well, personally, I would support it because I think going for people's property tax has failed because you're just hitting one segment of the population. Um, the tourists right now truly are not paying for the services that we're giving them. Right. So that's my feeling. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Boyce? Well, just to make sure that I, by being quiet, I don't uh, disregard Mr. Ostrowski's question. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very much in support and appreciative of the work that's been done. It's, it's almost a culmination of several years uh, that has been uh, somewhat refined here. So, yeah, I, I don't know if the board's going to be united, but uh, I certainly uh, stand with, with your positive comments, Commissioner Gold. Thank you. Any other comments before we go further? Okay. Then we'll move on to the next thing on the agenda. Thank you for coming, all of you that are working on this issue. If you want to slip out, that's up to you because we're getting to the fun stuff now, the uh, employee's uh, manual. And, and Julie you Swift. You guys would be excited. Julie Swift, if you're listening, could you come into the room? Here she comes. She's right here. She's she's right here. She is. Okay, never mind. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the employee manual. So this has uh, been worked on by uh, Commissioner Huxley, Council Huddle, and uh, HR Director Swift. Although I don't know what your real title is personnel coordinator okay anyway so they've been working on this for the past six or eight months 
This is basically to align the HR manual with your ordinance that you have a county administrator for the most part and also having uh, updates and coordination with CIS to make sure that their review of it is complete and that we uh, have all the current updates and guidance for that. The history of this would be going back to your the summer of uh, 2017 where you adopted a county administrator ordinance and this is probably one of the last things that you there are a couple other policies that need to be done but this is one that incorporates the ordinance into the actual procedures and manuals for the county to review so this was brought to the department head meeting on november 13th and so they they basically got a copy of it they did talk about it briefly we also brought it back to the department head meeting yesterday. We had approximately, I don't know, probably what, two and a half hour conversation on it. And so we have a, the packet that you see, we, we will go through and we have a couple uh, changes to this. I don't think they're material. Some of them are just what you might call Scribner's errors, but um, Jim Colin went through in depth and I appreciate his work on that. He put a lot of effort into reviewing this and we really appreciate his review on it. And we would like to go through with Ms. Swift to go through the changes that we came up with yesterday since what you have in your packet, we are recommending a couple other changes. And this is a, a workshop setting, so you're not voting on this. This would come back. Um, if there are a lot of changes, we would need staff time to review it, pack it back up. If there were significant or material changes, we'd want to bring it back to the department heads again for another review. So this is just a culmination of many, many months worth of work. So are you going to have to take this back to CIS again? No? Okay. No. Just curious. So, Commissioner Boyce? I'm, I'm a little unclear on the schedule here. If we're, obviously we're not going to vote today, but what the, the next path is to to getting this approved, I'm, I'm like I say, I'm a little unsure of that. So, um, the, the, kind of a time sequence, if you can. Yeah. So, ba based on how much how much change there is, if we don't have a lot of changes to this, um, I would probably just bring it back to the board at the next board meeting. If there's significant changes that I think I need to bring back for the department heads to review one more time, then we would probably schedule the the next department head meeting is going to be in January, and I can't read it from here, but. Um, we would bring it back to the department heads and then bring it back in January sometime. So, so that would be before the new board? No. Well, we, we it could be before the new board or after, after the board based on, again, how many changes are done. But did you get some other elected officials yesterday, and I honestly don't know the answer to this question, that wanted it not rushed or the appearance of pushing it through on the last bit of you know, governing time here. So I, I, I presume you got some of that Push back on that and said, "What is the hurry? There does seem to be a, an urgency here, and I don't, I don't understand personally myself." You're, you're, you're not sensing urgency from me. I'm just going the normal process on it. Um, there's okay. You know, wouldn't it make sense though to, to wait to the new board if it's uh, well? If it, I, I just like I said earlier, if, if there's material changes that we want to bring back for department head review for a third time, then we would wait. If there, if the material changes that are happening today really aren't. If there's no real material change, isn't that what you got yesterday? And isn't that isn't that going to take some time? It's 133 pages. Of well, that's rules. That's, <laughs> that that's why we're at this workshop here, which is we basically will walk through this document with okay, you. Okay. Direct and question, if I may, uh, Administrator Schroeder, did you get preferences from other elected officials yesterday and prior times that ask you to, what is the urgency? Why don't we wait? Uh, till even February. I, I, I don't know. Did you get those kind of comments and requests? I, I've got some people saying, you know, if there are questions, we can wait. Other people have said, let's, you know, we've been working on it for months and months. Let's get it done. Okay. In deference to the elected officials that we have in this, in this county, uh, I think we need to, to hear them out. That's all I have to say on it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. I say we move through it and see what the yeah. changes are yeah. that we're so we, we have suggested. the uh, on, on we, we have the packet as it is. So for page numbering, what would be the what would be the board preference to either look at it on the pages on your packet if you printed them out, or would you rather have it on the packet online? I there, printed it out. Did you print it out? And Mr. Bo Commissioner Boyce, did you print it out? No. 
Okay. All right. So we do we have a little bit. It's of on my time. priority list. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So maybe we should go to the um, since the other two did the uh, the actual one. It might align better to actually just go with this. I'm not going to be your most driver. <laughs> well, actually, I could if you want. Okay. Yeah. So, good morning, Commissioners. Julie Swift, Payroll and HR. Um, and as we said, Jim Colin did take time to go through, and he had several suggestions and and comments. And I've kind of I've incorporated what I could. So, if we go first of all to. Page 10, definition number 24, which is personnel officer. Is that page? Okay, wait till page. you get there and see if we're dealing with 10 of the total yes. PDF file or page 10 on the page rules. Page 10 of the rules. So this is still the revision on 10 2018? Yes. Then. So that's what we're dealing with. The last, okay. one, the last one that I sent out. You're scrolling through the packet right there, right? No, I'm on the Word document. Okay, I apologize. Because the, the, these Thanks. two commissioners had printed off okay. the Word document, and okay. it might be easier for them to follow along in their paper copies but, this way. But this Word document is in the packet. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Okay, it, it just has different All right. numbers, packet number versus page number. Yep. Okay. Okay, okay. so the comment on uh, the, way the, the way that the definition of personnel officer was written. This be number 24 here on the screen. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Personnel officer is a position delegated responsibility to assist the county administrator in the administration of the personnel rules and to perform other personnel administration duties as assigned. They preferred um, moving the word, moving county administrator to a different place. So personnel officer is the position the county administrator has delegated responsibility to assist in administration of the personnel rules. So just moved, moved it to be the position that the county administrator has delegated and not so much that it's the person just delegated to assist the county administrator. So just to move, to, just to reword and move that term yes. or those two words in a different location yes. in the paragraph. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and as we go through there, unless there, we'll just go through them and highlight them. And if you guys have concerns, let us know, you know, so. Um, one concern that was brought up uh, by the Teamsters Union, page, um, page 16, I'm sorry, page 16, item small e, the top of the page. Keep it right there. So where it says the county administrator and county legal counsel shall have access to all personnel. So this, this article has to do with personnel files and who has access and what goes in and what it contains. Um, and the Teamsters Union had brought up concern prior to, prior, prior to this wording, it said the Board of Commissioners and County Legal Counsel have access to all the personnel files. Teamsters didn't like that. They want, they want that if any personnel uh, files of their employees are gonna be accessed, they wanna be notified about it and they wanna know. They don't want anybody just going in and looking through somebody's personnel files for whatever reason. Um, I put this question out to LGPI to find out what other counties, if they have this kind of a language in there. Some do, some don't. Um, some, uh, yeah, some people don't have it. Uh, others have yes to both positions. Others have yes, but only with the employee's uh, permission. Um, so it's kind of, kind of varied. Um, particularly the sheriff doesn't like people having access to their employees' personnel files. What would be the reason? So it was proposed that we just take out that section because if it, the supervisor is gonna have access to the personnel files of their employees, um, if, the, if the person in question or person whose file wants to be viewed is a department head, then the county administrator as that supervisor would be the one to have access to that person's file. So question, and I'm thinking of as an employee, would the employee always be aware when someone is accessing their personnel file? 
well, they should be, but not necessarily exactly, not, not the way this is written. So there would have okay. to be, you know, and for, for anyone to come in and say, hey, I want to look at all the personnel files, that's not appropriate. One of the things that was done when um, we had our CIS HR review a couple of years ago was they request, they recommended two files on each person. You have a personnel file, which is information that would be considered public information, evaluations, discipline, um, application, anything without personal private information. And then you have a confidential file, and the confidential file would have those things as well as any signups for health insurance, W-4, anything with social security information, that kind of stuff. So I have two files currently on every employee. So there's the personnel file, and then there's the confidential file. So in my mind, if, if this stays in and the county administrator would want to view someone's file, they would look at the personnel file with which, what's considered public information, not necessarily the confidential file. So, if so that that's makes a public difference. information and public could access that at any time, or if a public records request was made potentially. Oh, okay. But no, no, because this, the, the public doesn't just to, to come in and view the files for the heck of it. <laughs> right. They'd have no. to. It would be to have, put in a request. Right. So, so. But tip typically the information in a personnel file is a matter of public record. Um, I did look this up after some conversation. Discipline action uh, is exempt from disclosure conditionally unless the public interest requires disclosure in the particular instance. And then um, public records, so the, the public records law has two types of exemptions. Conditional exemptions and then straight out exemptions. Uh, but again, both of, the one, both of the ones I'm talking about here have conditions to them. So personnel files are not exempt from disclosure. Those are subject to disclosure unless there's evidence or documents of personal discipline action, personnel discipline action. And then what is also exempt from disclosure is information of a personal, not personnel nature, uh, such as kept in a personal, medical, or similar file if public disclosure would constitute an unreasonable invasion of privacy but then it says, unless a public interest by clear and convincing evidence requires disclosure, the party seeking disclosure would have the burden of proof, et cetera. And then under that one, it says, um, a request for disclosure of records described in 192.355 uh, must include the name of individuals for whom the information is sought, statement describing the personal information being sought, a statement uh, that shows by clear and convincing evidence why it's required and then it says upon receiving a request for personal information a public body shall forward a copy of the request and material submitted with the request to the individuals whose personal information is being sought and to any individual representative of each class of persons whose personal information is being sought so the state law seems to already require um, if it's personal then the employees would get notice if it's just you know their application their employee vows those kind of things m most likely not personal um, so again uh, and then having the the, uh, the existing personnel regulations already allowed county council and the board of commissioners as a you know body not an individual commissioner to review it so really all we've done in this is um, change from Board of Commissioners to County Administrator. Uh, and so therefore, um, it's not that big of a change from how we've been doing things in the past. Uh, but the department heads did, uh, besides just the sheriff, did um, want to restrict uh, commissioner, council, administrator access to county personnel files. Right, they so. wanted to actually remove that item E. So as county council, you're fine with that, removing that item E, is that? Well, uh, not really. Oh. Um, it, it seems to create a, a right in the employees that they don't have under state law, so I'm really not in favor of it. Um, there's no evidence that it's ever been abused, so I don't see uh, the reason to change it. 
Uh, we do have a letter on file from the union, but that seems to be addressed by 192-363. Um, and, and so, you know, to me, it seems more like management prerogative, uh, classic under even uh, bargaining. So I'm, I'm really not in favor of, um, you know, saying that the county council or the county administrator can't look at a, an employee's personnel file. It seems, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Julie, the department had still wanted the, the managers to be able to look at the count at the personnel file. As in, yes. excuse me, as in supervisors. Yes. Yeah. Thank like, you. Like, you know, yeah. So, so they want, they wanted to be able to do it, but not have county council or the county administrator, essentially their boss and their legal counsel look at them. So it seemed, they seemed to be kind of picking and choosing what they wanted here. And it didn't, it didn't really seem to have a good policy basis. If the employees got a privacy interest in their file, then they, wouldn't even allow their manager to look at it. It just it just seemed like um, a request without really good justification other than a letter from a union. Commissioner Boyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, after what this county has been through the last four years uh, and, and to suggest that because there hasn't been abuse of uh, CE that there wouldn't be, I think the risk is too great. So no, my personal preference, Madam Chair, is to have that completely removed leave it up to our supervisors, the departments. If they need help or have other issues, they will come to legal counsel or even the commissioners. Thank you. Commissioner Huxley. I, I, I agree with county counsel. And when I know, I, they, I don't recall not the specific day that we talked about this, but when we did, I think it was, it was a good move that we removed the commissioners at the time. I still believe it was a good thing that we removed the commissioners at the time. Uh, but on this language, I completely agree with county council. Leave it, have it remain just as it has been revised. Okay, Julie, moving on. But did you have a preference on that or? I would have to go with county council on that. Let That's me, why I asked him that you question. Do you mind if I mention something? If you're gonna leave that in there, add a little bit of information to it saying that basically, they have to have authorization from the union representation. If they are union members? If they're union members, they should have authorization from the union to say, hey, we're going to look at one of your, and they should explain why, not just walk in and say, somebody says something about one of our employees and, and they walk in no and way. grab a file and, and take some action on it. That's, they're no protected way. by unions, so the, the union should have some authorization to say, or the sheriff to say, yeah, okay, you've given me justifications, go ahead and look. Sheriff, could I ask Hi, you a Calvin. question? On the screen here, you've got number C. Uh, it says, um, it, it says a supervisor <coughs> will have access to the files of subordinate employees um, or employees of other departments. There's no requirement that the employees get noticed that a supervisor wants to look at their file. Well, the, that it, this should be, that language should be changed as well. Anytime somebody's going to look at somebody's file, the person should be notified that, hey, they're going to be looking at your file. It's, it's pretty simple to add a little, a little bit of language to it. What's that based on? Why, why should an employee know that management's looking at their file for any reason? I mean, that, that, what about management prerogative that we retain? Uh, any type of disciplinary action. Um, we want to be upfront and honest with the people and, and transparent, not just go in there and, and blindside them. So, but even if you, excuse me, but even if you didn't, not notifying them just sounds like why would you keep it a secret? Why would they not be open to, uh, you know, absolutely consulted in that? And the people that aren't represented by a union, I mean, I. Th Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like they're even further out on the limb. Well, if we, we do disciplinary action, we bring them in right up front, notice them that we're going to be doing disciplinary action, and that may be as far as looking into personnel files. Thank you. So maybe I'm looking at the comments from LGPI, maybe just add language in there um, as long as they have a legitimate business need or something, something saying, you know. They're not just going to come in and look at files to look at files. I mean, I, I wouldn't allow that anyway. I, I do an evaluation of my employee. I look at their personnel file every time I look. I, and but you're the supervisor. Right. But again, so the supervisor, do, under this, the supervisor doesn't, isn't required to 
have any permission or give any knowledge to the employee that they're looking at the file, but they want to establish a different rule for county administrator, county legal counsel. Um, so it, it just, um, I, I just think if the county administrators got the power over the supervisors, I just don't quite understand the, the, the real concept for the rule. Um, I, I mean, I do understand the concept for the rule. Let the employees know when they're being looked at, I suppose, by the organization. So if anything negative is put in their file, they have to be notified so that they can... They know about it. So they can uh, say something about that in their file if they want to. Is that... Yeah, that's, that's in the next category, entry right. of materials in right. the files. But just to look at somebody's personnel file, um, again, I, I wouldn't want to limit management prerogative under any negotiating uh, union agreements, and I wouldn't want to give uh, employees any rights that they don't have as a matter of law. I would, so I, I, I don't quite see why we would be doing that. Agreed. Commissioner Boyce? We've spent enough time on that, in my view, Madam Chair, and it's going to be probably postponed, I would presume, until I don't know, into January or February anyway, so. Not necessarily. No. Oh, oh, there is a hurry. No, I just, <laughs> okay. I'm just going by, by what Administrator Schroeder said. Thank you. I'm I'll not. Take, I'll take your comments under consideration and change the language and coordination with Swift and Huddle, and we'll bring it back to the board. Okay. If we want to add language in there, like for legitimate reasons, you know, I think that I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, basically a legitimate business reason. Any supervisor should be able to look at their employees' files for legitimate business reasons, which are, I'm doing an evaluation of them. That's a legitimate business reason. Good. Mr. Huxley? As of this point, my understanding of the discussion on this is that we are in consensus, at least, of two plus the county administrator that we leave the language the way it is and we move to the next point. Is that correct? Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, that's and, fine. And let's move to the next point. Okay. So next is page 23. And in the previous version um, on section A, we had a sentence that said the compensation plan shall provide reasonably competitive ranges of pay for each classification of employment as determined by that would be the county administrator and um, we had removed that in the new one and i uh, the request was that we put that back in so you're talking about under section a section a so previously there was a statement that said the compensation plan shall provide reasonably competitive ranges of pay for each classification of employment is determined by the county administrator. They want that section put back in. So, so reasonably what? Reasonably competitive ranges of pay. So this just says they can, they'll pay whatever. Thanks. So they wanted just to say that it'll be reasonable, not just, you know, make everybody And I guess your definition of wage. reasonable has got to be <laughs> within our budget. Well, <laughs> Right, no. but not to not to just you know arbitrarily say okay everybody's going to get minimum wage that's it, you know it has to be reasonable. Commissioner Hosley. Well, that's why I'm looking at the one that we that, that it was struck through. Um, I, I'm going to again on the, these types of things where you defer to number one county council and what and to the administrator, um, whether it's, it's necessary to, to leave it back. And I don't remember specifically the conversation that we had when we removed that I sentence either. at some point over the last 10 months or <laughs> eight months or something. I just don't remember. It, it was a consensus of the department heads to add that back in, and I have no okay. objection. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't either. I okay. couldn't recall why okay. it was removed. Well, then I'm okay. good with it. Then, then let's, let's do that. Uh, next page, page 24, Article 10, we had quite a discussion on entrance salaries. Um, so it says, normally an employee will be appointed 
or reinstated the entrance rate for the class. If an appointing authority believes it's necessary to make an appointment or reinstatement above the entrance rate, authorization must be obtained in writing prior from the county administrator they wanted to take out or the board um, prior to the effective date. So the sheriff wanted, because the sheriff, um, when we changed the whole process of employ of department heads not having to bring every hire to the board and we went through the personnel action form instead um, and then they put a, a moderate hiring freeze so everything had to come before the board but the exception was the sheriff because he couldn't wait to hire you know to two four weeks or whatever hire people so we would like to put in here um, authority Believes it's necessary to make an appointment or reinstatement above the entrance rate, with the exception of the sheriff's of the sheriff's office. Comma authorization must be obtained in writing from the county administrator prior to the effective date. Well, the county administrator, when he signs off on the personnel action form, that's that in my mind is the authorization in writing. So we wouldn't need a separate document. The other um, thing that has also happened is when a department head or when a, when a position is getting hired outside of the salary range that it's set in, we're requiring, we're currently requiring the board to authorize those hires. Um, and I think we wanted a statement in there. So you're gonna add to that. that to it? Right, so okay. I would just if jot it down. If someone's hired outside of a range. So if an employee is to be hired at a salary range outside of a position's normal range, it must be approved by the board, is what we wanted to add in there. Okay. Just to clarify that. Well, and that's the process we just went through. Right. Right. Would you say that once more, please? We want to put in, if, if it's necessary to make an appointment or reinstatement above the entrance rate with the exception of the sheriff's office, authorization must be obtained in writing from the county in writing from the county administrator prior to the effective date of hiring. If an employee is to be hired at a salary range outside of a position's normal range, it must be approved by the board. Okay, so I'm gonna defer to Council Huddle again. Uh, I think I was on board with the changes after the review by the department heads, um, my recollection. So in, in other words, what we're trying to do is distinguish between a starting salary deviation and a range deviation. Right. Okay. Uh, it was it was not clear to the department heads when the board would be required. The board's not required for a starting salary deviation that's within the range. Right. But the board would be required for it going outside of the the range, right. which is like you said, what we did when uh, Mr. Stoffer was hired. Right. Uh, Commissioner Huxley. Okay, so if it's outside of the range, it's outside of the budgeted position or the budgeted amount in the last budget. We, we budget for particular ranges. Right. So if it's outside of that range, are we saying that we, right now we need to bring that back to the board because it was not approved by the budget it's it's budget law right if you will so are we saying we're we're trying to change that or am i still we're actually it's actually just what we're doing it's actually what we're doing okay, okay. so yeah. it's just it's just putting in the practice that we've got in place okay we're just I, actually have, putting it in yeah. writing okay. again yes. yes and i definitely right. agree okay. okay page 34. jeez we're really we're moving here this will be an easy one so at the top of the page where we have G appointments and um, most of the places within the document we took out the specification of department head and elected official and call it the appointing authority because the appointing authority is described in the definitions. So this is just doing that. This is just truing up the wording, taking out. So what, instead of being when a department head or elected official is selected a candidate to fill a position, the department head or elected official, blah, 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 blah. It's just gonna say when an appointing authority has selected a candidate, the appointing authority shall notify. So it's just words, wordsmithing. Which was that? Uh, G. Top of page, top of the page, okay. G. When an just an appointing yeah. authority we missed. On page 34. On page 34. Yep. Could, That's good. Could I, if I could, I've been kind of thinking about um, 
the personnel file issue. Mm -hmm. um, and we heard from the sheriff saying that he had received a letter from his bargaining unit about access to bargaining unit personnel fi files in the sheriff's department. But also, um, it would make sense to not have the county administrator access to personnel files of the sheriff department because going back to ordinance 1701 we did not give the county administrator any authority over That's employees true. in the sheriff's department so having a carve out for the sheriff's department in that would be consistent with the ordinance and uh, i think in a it might help address some of the concerns that we heard from the sheriff. But today. to leave it, leave legal counsel in. I don't. Yeah, I don't see a reason for departing from that. I, no. Again, I, I just, um, you know, I need to have access to that information yep. if we're going to do anything. So, um, it, I think it's good to have that be expressed versus have someone say, "Oh, he's looking at my stuff and he can't." So. Okay, so we'll work on that. I, I, if, if that's okay with the board, is that, do you? That makes sense. Okay. I just have one question sure. because sometimes we, we would go back and forth with the, the personnel officer and we have a definition for what the personnel officer is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think it would be better to not just remove the county administrator but to say the personnel officer and county legal counsel because the personnel officer is involved with the unions well personnel uh, are you personnel have, officer yeah. it's one uh, one item above yeah. uh, Correct. personnel officer has access for all personnel functions or something yep so it probably doesn't need to be restated again mm -mm. okay Jump ahead to page 64. Wowzer. We're halfway there. It's gone. <laughs> yeah. It's just a real simple. Okay, right there, a little bit further down, number four. Item A4, supervisors are to be familiar with the employee performance evaluation system and procedures established by the county administrator. The recommendation was to cross off or the board. Because it's an administrative action. Would you repeat that, please? Removing the three words or the board okay. in item A4. So supervisors are for me to, to be familiar with the employee performance evaluation system and procedures established by the county administrator, period. That's fine. So far these seem like pretty minor changes. Oh, that's just taking out a comma. That's no I was actually impressed by the level of detail that the assessor put into his review and comments, and he indicated to us in the meeting. I mean, we went over this for like three hours yesterday, and with the county county administration, uh, and the level of detail and um, just thought he put into it was really great. And then um, what uh, what he remind and I we invited him to be on the next uh, committee and he said he was on the original committee so <laughs> oh, okay. I think it's why and so, so he had a background there yeah. he had a little yeah he had a little vested interest in in the changes so anyway it was a really good job by Jim Cole and our assessor on this stuff well as well as the committee that was yep. a lot of work yep. I remember the one day we started on this and I could see right away <laughs> having Brant Media come and <laughs> do all this would have cost a fortune yeah okay page 71 um, Jim suggested because we have our section. the top of the page so he suggested because we have the other um, types of discipline underlined that we have termination from employment underlined also just for consistency and then on section G the second paragraph when we talk about um, this is having to do with um, conduct and discipline. And so 
uh, when it gets down into section G at the bottom, this, the first um, the first paragraph has to do with uh, deviations and violations of the standards above conduct and discipline, and what the employee does to report those types of things. The second paragraph has to do if if the deviations or violations are by a department head and it just wasn't clear to people how it was written so the re the suggestion was instead of saying further reports of deviations or violation from or violations of this by the department head blah 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 the request is further deviations from or violations by a department head shall be reported to county administrator and so just on to clarify yeah right. that makes sense because it's just a little muddy for people yeah, the question was, was the report by the department head or was the deviation by the department head? Reports of deviation by department head. So it's like, is it, are we talking about the, anyway, it got into a little wordsmithing, but I think we got through it. It's fine with me. Uh, that's just typo stuff. Oh, uh, page 80. We talk about workplace violence. If we have a zero tolerance policy, um, just to be again consistent with our wording on section B1, zero tolerance. Um, the suggest the way it's written: employees who display any violence in the workplace or threaten violence in the workplace are subject to disciplinary action up to and including the possibility of termination of employment. The request was to remove the possibility of, just to be consistent with our wording elsewhere in the process. So policies. just up and including termination? Mm -hmm. Up to and including termination of employment. Okay. Yeah. So this was kind of a, um, this is page 92, having to do with uh, tra employee travel. Um, and section four on page 92 when we talk about meal per diem uh, it talks about if employees elect to eat meals other than those provided as part of a conference or seminar they will be at their own expense a lot of people have dietary issues now and so they may get to a conference and lunch is you know cheese this cheese that and they have you know lactose issues and can't eat cheese so they're, ha they're forced to go find something else to eat and pay for it. The way, um, the way Cena does it now is if that situation exists, because you, you usually don't know what the meal is going to be. So what she does is if an employee goes to a conference or meeting or something like that and they get to a meal that they just flat out can't eat, um, they go get their food, they come back, they give Cena information on what the meal was that they couldn't eat, and she gives them the per diem rate for the for that meal. So I think maybe just somehow in here include, just say something, um, if employees elect to eat meals other than those provided or have dietary issues and are unable to eat the meal, then they'll get rid. So somehow in there, recognize that issue. Just say if they're unable to eat it because of dietary issues. They will be, they will receive per diem after the fact. Yeah. Just one sentence could suffice yeah. for that. Yep. You, buy, you buying lunch? <laughs> <laughs> um, the other issue that was brought up was our per diem amounts. Um, statewide average is $55 for a per diem, and we're at $42. Um, so it was suggested, and it's general consensus of the group was it's very hard to you know, unless you go to McDonald's all the time to fit into these meal categories. <laughs> so the suggestion was to maybe um, up our per diem amount to the state average, um, which in talking about it yesterday would break down to 14 for lunch, 16, or 14 for breakfast, 16 for lunch, and 25 for dinner. And for a total of? $55. $55. So how would that equate to how much we're spending on meals? Have you, you knew you were going to ask that question? No, we have not looked that up. This was just a. This I was think just kind before of a, we make a change like that, we need to know how okay. it's going to affect. The yeah, bottom Cena line. would have the information on how. In many fact, much. my request would be people just turn in their sales slips and forget the per diem. 
Well, the only problem with that is if you have some, you, then you'd have to have a limit. You, they can turn in their receipts and get this and get reimbursement. Well, but you'd have to have a, a limit. limit. Yeah. 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 Not for steak and lobster. <laughs> well, and, and if you're sharing a meal, if you're with a group, you mean you're going back and forth. If you're having wine with dinner, those are all things which overly complicate uh, a receipt-driven reimbursement system versus a per diem system. And I support a per diem system. Oh, I know. Everywhere I've always been, it's been receipts. So that's how, what I'm how used difficult. to. So, oh, all this last two years, I could have had free wine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink, so. I was gonna say. God. Commissioner Huxley? So how, how difficult or time consuming will it be to come up with a ballpark on what that number might be? I, they don't, I can't give you an answer on that. I it don't would, know. It would take a while to yeah. do. I mean, uh, you know, we could do it in a, another month or two. If, if we want to revisit it, we could revisit it. Well, right. one thing you okay. could do is just put it in as is with the idea that it's going to be investigated. And that's, you know, this this is a fluid document. And this right. is something Things that can, can be changed, changed anytime. It could be changed during the budgetary process when we're doing the budget, yeah. budget right. work okay. in the yeah. spring. Basically. I think that's probably a better way okay. to handle this. Okay. Okay. We'll analyze it in the spring when we do our budget committee meeting. Yeah. Okay. So How do you know I was going to ask we, that we question, will, however, by the way? Put the sentence in about the dietary under section it, four under the dietary yeah. uh, issues and this may have a gl you know my guess is it's got a has a gl it might not be as difficult as you think to, to pull it up right oh so go to page 107 we talked about self uh, telephone usage we're up to 1201 i've got Are, is it like gonna take i've got like two more tabs one of the discussions that we need to have. So we can finish up quickly. 107. I recommend yep. let's finish this. You said 107. 107. Um, instead of saying many employees. Oh, sorry. Section B, cell phones. Um, instead of saying many employees with a business need will be assigned, it was suggested that as determined by the appointing authority, employees with a business need for a cellular phone may be assigned a county-owned phone instead of will be because many don't want one um we we at the very top of that page we have the employees shall know have have no expectation of privacy while using county de issued devices and we copied that again in the cell phone section so that the request was to take that out the second to last sentence because we said it at the top the employee issue oh i see yeah so you just want to get rid of the redundancy right and then it was also suggested that we add a sentence saying information including text messages on a personal or county issued cell phone may be subject to public record retention and disclosure in accordance with Oregon law. To put people on notice that if they're, if they're using a personal cell phone for county business, that device could be um, requested for investigation as well as, so just to, just to make them thinking that text messaging is also part of this, not just calling all, all a cell phone and seeing the calls. Commissioner Huxley? Well, and, and in prior uh, litigation, that has that was the case. Right. My cell phone, for right. example. Yep. So that's just just putting that information in there. Okay. And it includes flip phones, too. <laughs> it includes what? Flip phones. Oh, well, you do have an old one, don't you? <laughs> but they, you know, they, they requested it. Well, okay, so then in um, the last thing I'm going to talk about now is, well, the last correction that needs to be made. on page 118, just when, just in lettering the policies, I noticed that I skipped E, so I'll have to re-letter those. The other conversation that we need to have, and it, we don't need to have it right now, but has to do with medical marijuana, and if we want to have a zero, to a zero tolerance policy or a zero impairment policy. So that's going to be, it's going to take longer than five minutes to have that discussion. So what does CIS say? They, they will approve either way. Okay, yeah. just curious. Yeah, so right now we have it in here as, as zero, you know, whether if, even if you have a medical card, you're, you, pa you can't pass a drug test, you don't get to qualify. So the question is, do you want And then want you it? get into the impaired thing and what is impaired. Right, <laughs> right. So. Yeah, so in, in our department, the department heads yesterday a discussion about this. Um, 
I think this is a really in-depth issue. I think it would take research and analysis, and I, I would prefer deferring that until we have uh, opportunities to, uh, you know, give up a good recommendation to the county board on it. Right now, the department heads are kind of back and forth on it. I think they'd like to see us uh, research it and come back with something at a future department head meeting and discuss that issue. Well, and as long as this is a, a fluid document, I think that's probably wise. Yes. Well, and I think Huxley. the CIS case law will give some direction to. to I, I, al I also think if the federal government removes it from the Schedule One, yep. uh, you know, yep. distinction or identification, yep. I think that will change an awful lot of uh, local government uh, regulations and laws. So I, at, th at this point, I think we should just wait what it is, and we'll either wait for laws to change or we'll give you further research and in the spring come back with something that maybe we make a recommendation. And I guess it all hinges on the word impaired. Right. What is impaired? So that is it. Yeah, well, I all. thank you for all your work. I, I know it was hours and hours and hours and hours. It was hours. This, so. Yeah. so, you know, so part of, part of bringing this back to the board for future consideration is um, if we have staff time, between you know today and you know Friday at noon to make these changes on here and put it together we will bring it back to the board on the 19th for uh, a vote um, if we don't have time to do it we'll bring it back at the you know the next available meeting it doesn't sound to me like there's that many changes really I, uh, that's my opinion but that would that, be my very, assumption I, I will leave very, that determination up to Miss Swift to make sure very she has few. time she may have other things on her yeah. workload um, but if there is time to do it, we'll bring it back because there, you know, really we've been waiting for 18 months to do this to align this document with your current ordinance, and there really isn't any, you know, the ordinance doesn't change, so you're basically just aligning your documents with your ordinance. I will do my best to get it done. Okay. I'm just going to offer that there is a public perception that you're trying to, to ram this through. You just mentioned 18 months, and now we're going to try and get it done in 18 days, if I understand correctly. So I, I just want to offer that that there is that perception, and it's. It's a little well, I kind of think the public needs to know that this was an ongoing task. It wasn't we just didn't put just together at the last, last minute. <laughs> we we no, just we no. just strongly disagree with that approach. It should wait. Okay, so I think we're through with all the business of this meeting. Yes, I have nothing further. So we are adjourned. So why is this like way the hell up? And it's twelve oh seven. I think we did pretty well. Thank you.